Sacramento circum circumstances of racialized segregation and inequality have been further worsened by the effects of the subprime lending. Over time, since the ratification of Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act, the old discriminatory, predatory, and ruinous contract lending practices have been abandoned. This has raised the need or opportunity for a new approach to home lending, as seen by the banks. Uh, lending in segregated, low-income neighborhoods. Gradually, the home lending establishment developed the subprime lending system to offer special mortgage pro products based on so-called risk-based pricing. Ostensibly, these are mortgages charging interest and fees according to the risk of default, not the race of the home buyer. But the risk is, of course, scored very high in racially segregated neighborhoods, neighborhoods burdened by the history of racial covenants, redlining, discrimination, and refused opportunity. Professor Jesus Hernandez of the University of California, Davis, has done a highly detailed study showing how subprime lending has been overwhelmingly concentrated and targeted, target marketed at the same neighborhoods that were historically contained by redlining and restrictive covenants. So is that it? Is that the end of the story? What about the what about the subprime mortgage crisis? Subprime mortgages entrap individuals and families attempting to buy homes in the segregated neighborhoods where historic exclusion has put them, requiring usurious interest arrangements and fees on them. Subprime mortgages, by their nature, inflict high rates of foreclosure and loss of equity. Again, this is in communities from which wealth is extracted, not to which wealth is accumulated. All right. So again, uh, Professor Jesus Hernandez of, the, of Davis has done this rigorously detailed study showing how the prime lending has been overwhelmingly concentrated and targeted at the same neighborhoods that were historically contained by redlining racial covenants. And that is to say, neighborhoods where Latino, African American, and other people of color are essentially segregated in their housing. Yes? So, you are saying that it is impossible to change this cycle of terrible inequality? No, but people must become active and organized to change this. It is not enough to recognize that it is wrong, but we must act. White silence is violence. Our local government still makes the situation worse, though. In, in 2013 and 2014, Sac County and Sac Sac City gutted affordable housing ordinances and since then we have seen a doubling of families living in poverty in Sacramento. Our city is now now has 66 unit is 66 units short 66 66,000 units short on affordable housing Unaccom unaccompanied youth on the streets is up 485% in the River City. Latino and African American Sacramentans are for disproportionately forced into homelessness now. What should that tell us about the anti-camping ordinance? It's overreach, the effect of just moving people from one piece of cardboard to the other. Yes! <laughs> Repeal it! Mr. Cerna's plan to spend $50 million, that is $5 million per year over 10 years, could go a long way to provide public housing instead of just letting rangers force people off riverbanks. Also, we've heard there's a law that says homeless people cannot be permanently removed from federal land unless there is someone for them to go. I'm pretty sure the riverbanks are managed by the Corps, Army Corps of Engineers which I suspect makes it federal property? Let's get an answer to who owns, not manages, the riverbanks. 
Our Mayor Steinberg issues golden vouchers for homeless people who are approved. Golden vouchers. Yes, but we all know that the no landlords will take them because City Hall has sat on their hands instead of incentivizing motel owners and apartment owners to work with displaced neighbors. Woo! How many people are living on the streets, being displaced by high rents and gentrification, and having no stabilization plan, no shelter, nothing but talk from our local elected leaders? Let's do a duet. Help us, Help us organize and stop this, this racist, racist history from becoming a racist future. And now uh, Susan Hastings is going to read a statement, which is a compilation of what three uh, uh, senior women uh, wrote us. So before we have that, um, somebody is driving a silver SUV that's parked over in the back, um, and the city employees are saying it's keeping them from using their parking. So whoever's got the silver SUV, uh, they're asking that we have it moved. Thank you. Conditions in Sacramento, in downtown Sacramento, for women to have access to showers and uh, and other resources need improvement. For example, the Loaves of Fish and Fishes Agency, women only Kimberly. have an opportunity Kimberly. to take a shower from 7:30 a.m. to 11:30 a.m., but only if they arrive and get a number on the list between 7:30 a.m. and around 8:30 a.m. After that, women are turned away, even if they have extreme hygienic-related needs. People can be unfriendly and items are stolen in the women's area of Wolves and Fishes Agency Probably. without the staff even knowing about it sometimes. And usually they say there is nothing you can do. The Salvation Army across the street only allows women to take showers if they're enrolled in the 60-day residential program. It is hard to get into the program because there is a long wait list as well as strict requirements in order to be accepted. The, the Union Gospel Mission has limited resources for women. Only on certain days, women are treated harshly at this agency and sometimes put out without anyone trying to accommodate each and everyone's needs Jamie. and making everyone feel doing? safe and welcome. This, there is definitely a need for better resources and quality services for women in downtown Sacramento. Women are discriminated Jamie. against. Schooled Jamie. like they are children, Jamie. and sometimes Jamie. not even Sky able to call for help should an emergency yeah. arise. If they said they can in downtown Sacramento, oh, sometimes okay. Okay. emergency no response representatives refuse to assist women when they call. They hang up in their faces and even threaten them not to call back. At nighttime and on weekends, the police department and even some of the members of our fire department sometimes refuse to drive a woman to the emergency room. They curse at women. They act like they're crazy and completely disrespect women. When there is no one around, they can get away with it. This all needs to change so that no woman can, can begin to feel like, so women can begin to feel safe. In the downtown Sacramento area, there is no excuse for problems like these. Give a big round of applause to your Sacramento Art Revolution. Uh, steadily bring in uh, truth to the front lines and with awesome skits and really informative skits, honestly. Um, so, as we can see, we have all these chairs up front that were supposed to be for the city and city council and the county board of supervisors. Thank you. Which, ironically, the city has talked about how much they make homelessness their top priority, right? Yeah, they had three weeks to... Uh, they were alerted three weeks ago that this event was going on. And they all responded with, oh, we have other priorities. That kind of shows how much actually hearing from the unhomed about homelessness is really on their priority list, doesn't it? Um, including one that was out of town or out of the country altogether. Um, but since they're not here, uh, everybody that's standing, feel free to go ahead and use these seats. Um, 
funny. It's not always fun to keep standing. <laughs> so, for... Where did everybody go? Yeah, well, I'm about to open it up for all of us to speak. Um, so, what we're going to be moving into next is starting to hear from some of our other own home residents. Um, I'm pretty vocal. Yeah, everybody kind of gets to hear from me at City Council pretty regularly. But there's a lot of our unhomed population that doesn't get heard, that people don't see. They're not on TV. They're not in the news. They're not able to be at City Council every week. And their voice is just as valid as mine or as anybody else here. Woo! So we're opening up for some of their voices to be heard. Hi everybody, I'm CJ. A lot of you guys know me. Hi uh, CJ! A few of you guys, good to see y'all. Um, I'm 20 years old, I've been celebrating my birthday for four years homeless. Not the best thing to look forward to, but you know what? Every day is a blessing for me. I get to meet new friends and stuff, but I like to read something that I found interesting on the internet. It's actually a, an event that I met you at a while back, if you remember. It was the fight for our rights and the rest continues. On March 29th of 2016, the Senate and Housing and the Transportation Community voted against SB 876, the Right to Rest Bill. SB 876 demands an end to discrimination policy practicing the crisp, uh, criminalizing homelessness people for sitting, resting, sleeping, lying, and eating in public when they have nowhere else to go. So, while the legislation has not passed the Senate, this year, the fight for our right to rest has continued. Organization, the rest, eh, I cannot speak today. <laughs> Western Regional Events and Project, oh, we like to call it the WARP, coaching of the nine cores organizations and over 175 allied organizations in three states filled the room with poor and homeless people waiting on bated breath to see if their right to exist would be granted by the state of California. I'm still waiting. And it's been Damn seven right. Years. Still waiting. Woo. Nice job, CJ. Uh, hey, folks. My name is uh, Jamie Cook. Um, I want to thank uh, Sean for putting this uh, together and inviting us all here. Uh, I have been homeless since uh, last February. And I'd like to tell you a little bit of personal stuff about myself. I have been a resident here since 1990, about 27 years now. I've been a Sacramento resident. Uh, I went to Cal State and uh, got my bachelor's degree in uh, communication studies. Uh, for the past 10 years, up through August of last year, I was uh, working for the state of California. Uh, I've always been a renter here up through last year, and I've always paid my rent on time. Uh, in August of 2016, I became disabled. Uh, the California State uh, EDD is uh, disputing the fact that I am disabled. I have a Mount Everest worth of uh, <laughs> documentation from various doctors, and my case is on appeal right now. In the meantime, I have no income and no place to, or no way to pay rent. Uh, I have been over by Loaves and Fishes. Uh, the Volunteers of America have helped me out, God bless them, uh, as have the people at the uh, Gospel Mission. And uh, since this uh, situation had to happen, I feel blessed that these good people are here in this community and uh, do want to help the uh, homeless. Uh, I have, uh, like our last speaker, met some very good people uh, on the street. Uh, we are a diverse bunch, uh, diversity of races, diversity of uh, backgrounds, and uh, diversity of uh, circumstances. And hmm. yet, uh, there is some camaraderie on the street. If you've ever talked to the folks around the Loaves and Fishes uh, area, we do, in spite of our uh, differences, uh, racial, economic, and otherwise, come together. And I've been very touched by the way the uh, uh, homeless folks in this community are dedicated to helping each other. That, uh, that touched me very deeply, despite our differences. Uh, I say this because there is the stigma attached to homelessness that are, we are simply moral transgressors, and mm. we deserve to be ignored mm -hmm. for that reason. Uh, please understand uh, that is certainly not necessarily the case, and I want to speak to everybody, including those who are conspicuous by their absence, to uh, please uh, have compassion and uh, do more to help the homeless, and I want to thank you. 
And uh, to speak further, uh, here's my new friend Chris, who'd like to say a few words to you. <laughs> I'm a former foster youth. Well, now I'm homeless. I've been homeless since September 25th of 2016. Um, a little bit about me is that from ages 13 to 18, I was in foster youth, going through all the group homes, going through four years of not being able to see my brother, not being in his life, not to motivate him. And after I became homeless, after leaving my mom's, I felt like that I had to motivate myself to get better, so I started going to college, I started getting myself together, started trying to get to housing. Uh, recently I became homeless again because of a lot of stuff that's been happening. Um, but the basic life of me being homeless is, if I don't have transportation, I, actually this last Wednesday I walked 35 miles because I had to uh, go to all the doctor's appointments and everything I needed to get done. and I did my best to be able to do it, and I still did stay hydrated, but it doesn't help when we're not able to have water in our community. Yeah. And yeah. I don't understand why, when we have a right to have water, but we have to fight for our own rights. And I just don't understand it. My everyday life, usually when I, another day, actually yesterday, when I was walking around, I saw somebody that was homeless that usually before when I wasn't homeless, I wouldn't help out the community they were homeless. Now that I've been home, become homeless and I've realized how much the struggle is to, to live the life of being homeless is I had only like, I think a dollar left in my wallet or anything left for the rest of the week and I gave them that. And I and even the little things help. Motivate yourself to do better, be optimistic, mm. look at the bright things of life. Anything can happen at any second. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. My day-to-day -day life, when anybody asks me how my day is going, I say, could be better, could be worse. Anything can change any second. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Be optimistic. Way to go, Christopher! Woo!